I love coming to First Baptist Church of Bridgeport. I'm glad I get to still be a member here. I'm glad they didn't kick me out. Some of my preacher friends I haven't seen for a while, and I need to be open about this. I've recently begun to identify rather strongly with the LFTB community. That stands for less fat than before. <laughs> I've lost about 35 pounds. I need to lose that much again. Uh, so I'm still fat, but I now identify as skinny. <laughs> and I'd appreciate it if you'd address me that way. I, I guess that makes me trans fat. I'm not sure. <laughs> I think I'm going to preach a different message than I intended. I, I believe I should preach on bitterness. Our friends of Bridgeport Baptist Academy, some wonderful people in our church, worked very hard to put on a great auction and raise money for the school. They did a fabulous job this year. Last year, I purchased a reserved parking spot for a year. Now, at that time, I was the pastor and had a place I parked. And they said, why are you doing that? I said, I'm going to give that to my wife when I'm not the pastor. And so they let me start it just this meeting. And they made a nice sign up. And uh, my wife said, honey, make sure they make it up in time for church traffic because you might want to have a good place to park and you want to have a reserve spot. And so they did. And they put it right out by the school door. And I drove in this morning to use it for the first time. And somebody had parked a little Buick there. And didn't even park it straight. But I figured out it was my sister-in-law, Kathy Jackson. She was unloading her chalks for the talk, and I said, that's, that's all right, that makes sense. And Chrissy would prefer her sister to have the spot to me. And the spot does say reserved for Mrs. Chrissy Willette. But tonight, it was raining, and I thought this is going to be great. I'll drive in, there'll be a nice spot there. And there was a black Acadia there. And I thought, who in the world is that? Well, I discovered it was not Mrs. Jackson, it was her husband. <laughs> who had assumed that I would already be here when he got here. And surely, I'll tell you what, my wife would not prefer you to have the parking spot to me. So open to Hebrews 12 and I'll preach on bitterness this evening. Numbers chapter 16, if you would please. Wonderful conference. Pastor Howell, thank you. I said this morning when I had the chance to speak, I love my pastor. I love what is happening at First Baptist Church of Bridgeport. I fully and completely and gladly, enthusiastically, joyfully support his leadership. And really, really glad at all the good things you're doing. Thank you, First Baptist Church, for being faithful, for working so hard to put on this partic- this wonderful meeting. Thank you for the basket of goodies that you gave me. The great meals have been provided, and you've been so kind. This is a wonderful, wonderful church. I'm going to remain seated as I read. Uh, I have a friend, Doug Fisher, and he kind of judges his sermons by how many scriptures he goes to. He moves through the Bible. His people will say, Pastor, you only had three scriptures this week. You must not have had time to study. I preached at his church one time from this passage, and I said, I have 50 scriptures. But they're all from the same chapter. So follow along as I read number 16, if you would please. Now, Korah, the son of Izhar, the son of Kohath, the son of Levi, and Dathan, and Abiram, the sons of Eliab, and On, the son of Peleth, sons of Reuben, took men. And they rose up before Moses with certain of the children of Israel, 250 princes of the assembly, famous in the congregation, men of renown. And they gathered themselves together against Moses and against Aaron and said unto them, Ye take too much upon you, seeing all the congregation are holy, every one of them. And the Lord is among them. Wherefore then lift ye up yourselves above the congregation of the Lord. And when Moses heard it, he fell on his face. Good idea. People criticize you. Instead of answering them, talk to God. He spake unto Korah and unto all his company, saying, Even tomorrow the Lord will show who are his and who is holy, and will cause him to come near unto me. Even him whom he hath chosen will he cause to come near unto him. Moses didn't volunteer for this job. He didn't even want the job. God told him to do it. This do ye. Take censors, Korah and all his company, And put fire therein, and put incense in them before the Lord tomorrow. And it shall be that the man whom the Lord doth choose, he shall be holy. Ye take too much upon you, ye sons of Levi. 
And Moses said unto Korah, Here, I pray you, ye sons of Levi, see with but a small thing unto you that the God of Israel hath separated you from the congregation of Israel to bring you near to himself, to do the service of the tabernacle of the Lord, and to stand before the congregation to minister unto them. And he hath brought thee near to him, and all thy brethren, the sons of Levi, with thee. And seek ye the priesthood also? For which cause both thou and all thy company are gathered together against the Lord. Interesting, against the Lord. They thought they're attacking Moses. And what is Aaron that you murmur against him? And Moses sent to call Dathan and Abiram, the sons of Eliab, which said, We will not come up. Is it a small thing that thou hast brought us up out of a land that flowed with milk and honey to kill us in the wilderness? Except thou make thyself altogether a prince over us. Moreover, thou hast not brought us into a land that floweth with milk and honey, or given us inheritance of fields and vineyards. Wilt thou put out the eyes of these men? We will not come up. Two chapters earlier, the entire congregation of the children of Israel, excepting Joshua and Caleb, had voted not to go into the promised land. Now those who voted not to go in are blaming Moses for the results of their disobedience. Not unusual. Moses was very wroth and said unto the Lord, respect not their offering. I've not taken one ass from them, neither have I hurt one of them. And Moses said unto Korah, be thou and all thy company before the Lord, thou and they and Aaron tomorrow, and take every man his censer and put incense in them and bring ye before the Lord every man his censer, 250 censers. Thou also and Aaron, each of you his censer. They took every man his censer and put fire in them and laid incense thereon and stood in the door of the tabernacle of the congregation with Moses and Aaron. And Korah gathered all the congregation against them under the door of the tabernacle of the congregation. And the glory of the Lord appeared unto all the congregation. And the Lord spake unto Moses and unto Aaron, saying, Separate yourselves from among this congregation, that I may consume them in a moment. And they fell upon their faces and said, O oh God, the God of the spirits of all flesh shall one man sin, and wilt thou be wroth with all the congregation? And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Speak unto the congregation, saying, Get you up from about the tabernacle of Korah, Dathan, and Abiram. And Moses rose up and went unto Dathan and Abiram. And the elders of Israel followed him. And he spake unto the congregation, saying, Depart, I pray you, from the tents of these wicked men, and touch nothing of theirs, lest ye be consumed in all their sins. I've never done it, but I think you can make a pretty good sermon from that verse. And find a lot of good life advice. So they got up from the tabernacle of Korah, Dathan and Abiram on every side. And Dathan and Abiram came out and stood at the door of their tents and their wives and their sons and their little children gathered together in rebellion and opposition to God's appointed leader. And Moses said, Hereby ye shall know that the Lord hath sent me to do all these works, for I have not done them of mine own mind. If these men die the common death of all men, or if they be visited after the visitation of all men, then the Lord hath not sent me. But if the Lord make a new thing, and the earth open her mouth and swallow them up with all that appertain unto them, and they go down quick into the pit, then ye shall understand that these men have provoked the Lord. I guess you should understand that. The ground opens up, they're swallowed up, and the ground closes up again. You pretty good idea God was not happy with them. And it came to pass as he had made an end of speaking all these words that the ground clave asunder that was under them and the earth opened her mouth and swallowed them up in their houses and all the men that appertained in the core and all their goods they and all that appertained to them went down alive into the pit and the earth closed upon them and they perished from among the congregation. And all Israel that were round about them fled at the cry of them for they said lest the earth swallow us up also. There came out a fire from the Lord and consumed the 250 men that offered incense. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Speak unto Eleazar, the son of Aaron, the priest, that he take up the censers out of the burning, 
And scatter about the fire yonder, for they are hallowed. The censers of these sinners against their own souls, let them make them broad plates for a covering for the altar, the brazen altar, the altar of sacrifice. For they offered them before the Lord. Therefore they are hallowed, and they shall be assigned unto the children of Israel. And Eliezer the priest took the brazen censers, wherewith they that were burnt had offered, and they were made broad place for a covering of the altar to be a memorial unto the children of Israel, that no stranger which is not of the seed of Aaron come near to offer incense before the Lord, that he be not as Korah, and as his company, as the Lord said to him by the hand of Moses. But on the morrow all the congregation of Israel murmured against Moses, and against Aaron, saying, Ye have killed the people of the Lord. And it came to pass when the congregation was gathered against Moses and against Aaron, that they looked toward the tabernacle of the congregation, and behold, the cloud covered it, and the glory of the Lord appeared. And Moses and Aaron came before the tabernacle of the congregation. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Get you up from among this congregation, that I may consume them as in a moment. And they fell upon their faces third time. And Moses said unto Aaron, take a censer and put fire therein from off the altar and put on incense and go quickly unto the congregation and make an atonement for them. For there is wrath gone out from the Lord. The plague is begun. And Aaron took as Moses commanded and ran into the midst of the congregation. And behold, the plague was begun among the people. And he put on incense and made an atonement for the people. And he stood between the dead and the living and the plague was stayed. Now they that died in the plague were 14,700. Beside them that died about the matter of Korah. Add the 250 who were consumed with fire. You've got 14,950. Add those that were taken up into the earth and you have somewhat over 15,000. And Aaron returned unto Moses. Under the door of the tabernacle of the congregation and the plague was stayed. Lord, thanks for the privilege and undeserved honor of being in this meeting, of being your son and your servant. I'd like to help the preachers and the people and all the folks that are gathered, but I can no more help them than you help me. Lord Jesus, you said without you I can do nothing. So, Holy Spirit of God, would you please empower me and use me and direct all that is said and draw us to yourself and help us to long remember when we've forgotten where we heard it or who was the instrument you used to deliver it the truth that you have for us tonight well thank you in jesus name amen i'll give you a brief explanation of this story there were some quality people <coughs> princes of the congregation the sons of levi the tribe chosen to do the work of the lord leaders most church trouble does not start with a hard-working factory man. It starts with somebody who thinks he's a boss. May be a boss at work and thinks they ought to be a boss at church. And they became quarrelsome, they said now. And they gathered 250 leaders, princes of the congregation. And they said, Moses, you take too much upon you. Why, we're all holy. We have the same relationship with God you do. That's kind of true. Every child of God has direct access to God through the Lord Jesus Christ. These, uh, many of them were Levites, some Reubenites, uh, sons of the firstborn. And uh, we're all holy. How come you always get to be in charge? They were quarrelsome. They're always quarrelsome people. Four times before I left as pastor of this church, I did a little exercise with our congregation. I was wonderfully privileged as the pastor. I had tremendous liberty. Nobody bothered me. If I said, right, so-and-so check, they wrote him a check. <coughs> if I said, we're going to support this missionary, nobody said, how are we going to vote on that? We had one business meeting a year. It lasted about seven or eight minutes. I voted on the budget, voted on deacons. Usually didn't have any questions. We had one deacon's meeting most years, lasted about seven minutes. We didn't even sit down. We'd come in the office and stand in front of the desk. I understand that somebody said we can get to sit down at the deacon's meetings now. And Pastor Howell's going to keep the faith. <laughs> you haven't let him sit down yet, have you? All right, amen. 
that's Bible. But I said there are people who will resent that. And when Pastor Howell comes, they'll try to get in and, and uh, limit his liberty. You think Pastor Howe should have had all those songs? It was almost eight o'clock before the preaching began. And then it went on until 930. And that was just reading that whole chapter. That was not a prophetic utterance, by the way. And I said, the Bible tells you what to do with people like that. It tells you to give them a dirty look. It does. The north wind driveth away rain, so doth an angry countenance a backbiting tongue. And I said to the congregation, everybody go like this. Do that. Would you with me? Everybody do it like this. Oh, some of you already were. I'm sorry. (laughs) And then I said, I want you to point to those people and say, we were warned about people like you. Now, why did I do that? Because I knew there'd be folks who are quarrelsome. Why did I do it tonight? Because (coughs) some of you lay people here with your pastors need to understand those folks are going to come up. Not likely you, you're likely supportive. That's why you're here. That somebody's going to come up and give them a dirty look. And say, hey, let's go talk to the pastor right away. Oh, no, don't tell him I told you that. Well, then don't tell me. But they got a quantity with them. By verse 19, the Bible says, Korah gathered all the congregation against them under the door of the tabernacle of the congregation. Do you know... Critical people are never content to be critical by themselves. They always want to make you critical too. Misery loves company. And then God sent a quenching. Mm, There was a challenge. Bring some censors and have (coughs) fire in them. We'll see who God chooses and who he does. And if these men die like other men die, then God hath not spoken by me, said Moses. But if there's an earthquake and they get swallowed up, then you know the Lord has spoken to me. There's an earthquake. And then fire concerns the 250 leaders. And then the congregation still upset because of the rabble-rousing of the quarrelsome uh, <coughs> quality people <coughs> gets upset with Moses and says, you've killed the congregation of the Lord. And then God sends a plague on the whole congregation. <clears throat> I told our folks, when I'm not the pastor, I'll still love you. I still pray for our people just like I did when I was a pastor. Same prayer list. I'm still a member of the church. I still love the church family. For a long time, I've been praying for Pastor Howell every day and his wife and children continue to do that. And I said, uh, you can call me anytime. You can talk to me. You can even ask me questions, but if you say one critical word about Pastor Howe, I will hang up the phone. Be careful about that. A friend of mine, Rick Finley, succeeded a founding pastor of a great church in Durham, North Carolina. At first, everything went well, and then that pastor's, the founding pastor's wife, kind of got upset about some things, and she stirred up a lot of trouble. And he called me one day, so we're having a big business meeting tonight. Would you come down and moderate it? So I got on an airplane, flew to North Carolina. There were six uniformed police officers at the meeting. Reporters were trying to get in the church. They wouldn't let them in. They recorded the meeting. This was a long time ago by audio, video, and stenographically. And I watched those people (coughs) bring terrible accusations against their pastor. Why they said, Pastor, (coughs) you have (coughs) gotten the male staff members a suit on their birthdays and the church never voted on it. (coughs) Well, when the previous pastor was the pastor, (coughs) they never voted on stuff like that. Some of stood up and said, hey, we got all these coats the ushers have. You, former pastor, had us get them. The church never voted on that. But it got worse. They said, uh, you purchased some things for the church, and along with that, you purchased a bag of dog food. Now, you reimbursed the church for the dog food, but because it was a church purchase, you didn't pay tax. You did not pay tax on your dog food. Horrible things you had done. 
I moderated the meeting. The vote was taken. He, oh my goodness, he went something like 250 or 60 to 70 something. And when he got all done, he stood up and he said, all my life, all I ever wanted to do was make my pastor proud of me. And he said, I plead with you folks who voted against me, stay here. I love you. I want you to be in this church. And he said, you folks who voted for me, don't be upset with these people. Don't be angry with them. Love them. Couldn't have seen anybody do it better. They didn't. The uh, former pastor, shortly after that, discovered he had prostate cancer. His adult daughter had a stroke. His son-in-law had a back problem, required surgery, and his underage daughter took his car out without a driver's license and totaled it. A lady whose son is in his 40s came to the business meeting just to vote. The son came just to vote <coughs> against the pastor and died of a heart attack shortly after that. Another man lost two fingers and damaged the rest of his hand in a saw accident who voted against the pastor. Another had his mother suddenly pass away. Another was fired from the job that he'd worked for uh, for well over 20 years. Another, uh, uh, I love this one the best, this guy had a rental house in a poor section of town and he went to collect the rent and found out somebody had stolen his house. <laughs> they had dismantled it a piece at a time and taken the whole house away. We've had cars stolen in our ministry, but never houses. <laughs> One lady was severely injured, injured in a freak automobile accident on Thanksgiving Day because her son passed out at the wheel. And she said to one of the ladies in the church, I've learned my lesson. I'll never say anything against the preacher again. Good idea. Explanation. But I see in this story an illustration. Here is Aaron. The high priest. He is somewhere around a hundred years old. Spurgeon said he may have been as much as 120, but a hundred's fair. And the people have criticized him. They've accused him of taking too much upon him and they've, they've wanted to unseat him from the position that God had given him and they've unfairly and unjustly attacked them and now a plague comes. What would you do if God started to judge your enemies? Man, 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 man. Moses didn't have the book of Proverbs but he understood the principle. Don't rejoice when your adversary is punished. I may see that, God said, and withhold the punishment from them because I don't like your attitude. Aaron takes the censer, almost a hundred years old, his priestly robes flowing behind him. And the Bible says, at the encouragement of Moses, he does not walk, he does not jog, he runs into the people, right into the midst of those that are dying. The flame is spreading like a prairie fire. And Aaron runs and holds the censer up to deliver his attackers, to deliver his critics, to deliver those who wanted him out of the job that God had given him. And the plague was stayed. I like that. That reminds me of another high priest. Who yes. now is made nigh by the appearing of our Savior who hath abolished death. And it's about life and immortality to light through the gospel. And I think more of my Savior than I do of Aaron because Aaron was a human being and human beings that attacked him. And nobody has ever been treated like my Savior. Nobody has ever had all the weight of the sins of the world upon his back. And I, I remember the fact that I have a Savior who when I was his enemy was willing to bleed and die on the cross and bear my sin in his own body so that I could have ever everlasting life. Oh, we did right last night to sing all hail the power of Jesus' name. Let angels prostrate fall, bring forth the royal diadem and crown him Lord of all. Here he is despised and rejected of men. They have plucked out his beard. They have buffeted his face. They have beat him with a cat of nine tails, raked it across his back. They have taken a crown of sharp thorns and jugged, jammed it into his head. They have nailed him to a cruel cross 
cross and lifted him up, not with a loincloth as the artist modestly and appropriately depict him. The victim of crucifixion was allowed no decency, no modesty at all. And our Savior hung there on that cross bearing shame and scoffing rude. In my place condemned he stood, sealed my pardon with his blood. Hallelujah! What a Savior! I admire Aaron, but I adore Jesus. I, I, I'm endeared to Aaron, but I exalt the Lord Jesus Christ. I glance at Aaron, but I gaze with awe at the Lord Jesus. I'm pleased with Aaron, but I praise from the bottom of my grateful heart my Savior who filled with his own blood the censer and stopped the plague of sin and by his sacrifice on Calvary gave me everlasting life and made me his child and gave me a home in heaven and indwelt me by his Spirit and guided every step of my life. I'm glad I have a Savior named Jesus. Jesus, oh how sweet the name Jesus. Every day the same Jesus. Let us all proclaim the precious name of Jesus. Jesus is the sweetest name I know. And he's just the same as his lovely name. And that's the reason why I love him so. For Jesus is the sweetest name I know. <coughs> but I'd like to not only give you an explanation of this passage and tell you that I see in it an illustration of our Savior, I think it'd be appropriate to make an application. See, the Bible says that we have a similar responsibility to that of Aaron. It says in 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 20 that we are ambassadors for Christ. It's our job to be seech men, to be reconciled to God. The Apostle Paul said, here's what my job is. It's to open their eyes and to turn them from darkness to light and from the power of Satan unto God that they may receive forgiveness of sins and inheritance among them which are sanctified by the faith that is in me. See the old man, a hundred years old at least. Not worrying about how his arthritic joints may feel in the morning. Not concerned about whether he may, with his brittle bones, stumble and fall. Holding the censer with incense on it. The incense uh, uh, that speaks uh, 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 of a reconciliation between God and man. Uh, that, that speaks of, of the fact that, that we need to come to God not in our own strength and not because of our own behavior. Uh, and he runs and he knows why he must do it because he's standing, the Bible says between the living and the dead. Can I remind every bus worker in this room, you're just trying to have a good crowd. You're not just trying to fill your bus up. You're not just trying to get some boys and girls to come from sad circumstances and difficult situations and be in a place that people love them. Oh, no, no. Those are people that will almost never in any other circumstance, unless you go talk to them, hear the gospel of Jesus Christ. And when you go, you're not just trying to fill a bus route. You're not just trying to knock on a certain number of doors. You're not just trying to pass out a certain number of tracks. You are standing between the living and the dead. Soul winner. We keep track of the contacts. I'm glad to see 2,216 contacts the last week up on that board and 12 people saved and 216 people going out soul winning. Man, I think that's wonderful. And <clears throat> I laud that and I appreciate that. But remember, when you go, it's not just to fill out the slip and it's not just to knock on X number of doors and it's not just to complete a map and it's not just to get a certain area covered. You are standing between the living and the dead. There are people you talk to who may never again hear a gospel message. Brother Joe Galganski is here tonight. He and I were out soul winning one Saturday morning. We were down in the south end. We saw a little boy with his hands tucked up into his sleeves. He got his hand gloves. And he's running around in the snow digging out bottles so he could turn them in for a deposit and buy some candy. And we went and talked to him. And we gave him the gospel. I think he was maybe what? 10, 11 years old, 8 years old, something like that. a young boy. Now, while I was giving him the gospel, here's what... A voice said to me, you shouldn't do that. He's a fairly young child. Uh, get him to church. Get him in junior church a little bit. Make sure he knows what he's doing. And then give him the gospel. Might I suggest to you, it is never God telling you to not give the gospel. Amen. We went ahead, gave him the gospel. He prayed. He trusted Christ. I said, would you like to come to church? We got a bus. Yeah, yeah. 
He ran ahead of us, just lived a couple blocks away. Got into the house before we got out of the car. And as I walked up to the door, Brother Joe and I walked up, we heard his grandmother say, no, you can't go to that church. Hmm. I pretended like I didn't hear it. I acted dumb. Well, it's not much of an act for me. <laughs> and I, <clears throat> I said, hi, I'm Pastor Led. This is with Joe Gaganski. We met your grandson earlier. We went, no, he can't go to church. I didn't know when I was talking to him, I would never have another opportunity. I didn't realize it. I don't know what happened to him. I don't know where he is now, but I know he heard the gospel and asked Jesus to save him. And I know now that that day we were standing between the living and the dead. Layman in your workplace, it's good to be a witness, it's good to be a testimony, uh, but realize this is not just so you can feel good about yourself and feel like you've been faithful to, to honor the Lord Jesus. No, no, no. There are people there that are going to live in heaven or hell forever, and the only difference in where they spend up eternity is if somebody tells them about Jesus, you're standing between the living and the dead. I appreciate my preacher brethren. I've been traveling a little more and I'm really encouraged by what I see out there in our good independent Baptist churches. And a lot of people don't get to have this big a crowd and don't get to have this nice of facilities. And sometimes the devil tells them what they do is not all that important. You heard Brother John Morrow just very honestly and transparently share his testimony. Wonderful guy. I've preached for him every other year since 2011. Just preached for him a few weeks ago. The town in which he pastors has less than 100 people. Population less than 100. His church runs about 70. That's a pretty good percentage. They have a really strong percentage come back on Sunday night and through the nights of the meeting. They have a Christian school. They operate a bus ministry. Uh, he used to drive a public school bus before he was able to be full-time in the church that he started there. And he said, I prayed one day, God, I'm going to drive this bus. I'd like to see some of these kids come to church. And one of his piano players and her brother and their spouses and kids are in the church because of an answer to that prayer. Brother John Morrow drove a bus because he needed some money to take care of his family in the early days of the church before they could support him full time. But he realized driving the bus wasn't just about getting money. He was standing between the living and the dead. I hadn't been to this church long. <coughs> Got a phone call from Mount Morris Flint where I'd pastored, been a youth pastor. Elsie Britt, the lady who worked with us in the youth group, said, Pastor Renee, have you heard about Penny Shire? No. I remembered Penny Shire. Penny and her sister Rita came to a youth activity. Rita was older and she was saved. Penny wasn't saved. I went by the house and Mrs. Shire was there ironing and she let me sit down and talk to Penny and give her the gospel. And I got all done and said, Penny, would you be willing to pray and ask the Lord Jesus to be your Savior? And her mother, for the first time, interrupted and said, she's not old enough for that. I said, ma'am, I'm not talking about joining the church or getting baptized. I was saved when I was four years old. It's just asking Jesus to forgive your sin and trusting him to take you to heaven when you die. And she said again, she's not old enough for that. And I said, well, Mrs. Shire, if, if Penny comes to youth activity and if while she's there... She wants to ask the Lord Jesus to be your Savior. Would that be okay? And strangely, she said, yes, that'd be all right. She came and I always gave an invitation. And I always looked to see if Penny raised her hand and Penny never responded. Elsie Britt said, Penny Shire has been in a terrible automobile accident. She's riding in a pickup truck with her dad, a young man in a Chevrolet Vega, deliberately pulled out in front of them, smashed into them because he wanted to take his life. He left a note. That's how they know that. Her father was killed. And Penny was covered with terrible burns. I went to see her at the Hurley Hospital in Flint. Put on the booties and the robe and the gloves and the mask. Walked into the room. I wouldn't have recognized her if they hadn't told me it was her. She was in a coma. I said, Penny? This is Pastor Renee. 
Sometimes people can hear you when they're in a coma. Sometimes they can't. I said, Penny, you don't have to be in church to get saved. And Penny, you don't have to be able to talk or pray out loud. Penny, if you just trust Jesus, just ask him to save you. He'll save you. Just ask him to be your savior. Penny, will you do that? Penny, if you, if you trust Jesus, can, can you move a finger? Can you blink an eye? She never moved. She died long, not long after that. I don't know if she's in heaven or in hell. I didn't know it that day. I went by the house that I was standing between the living and the dead. My wife and I went out soul winning one Thursday morning, these apartments over here on Washington Street. Visited a lady named Chris Soroya. She'd been to the church, had two daughters, Leslie and Aisha. And Chris listened to the gospel and prayed and trusted Christ and came to church real regular for a while. And then she drifted a little bit and her children began, began to continue to come. They, they moved over into some houses off of Outer Drive behind steering gear kinda. One day a lady in our church, Shelby Matheson, went by to pick up the kids. It was Easter Sunday. And she heard yelling in the house and all kinds of strange things. And Chris Soroya came to the door. Her boyfriend had been on drugs or something was crazy. And she said, oh, yes, we should go to church. Let's go to church. Let's all go to church. Kids, get ready. We'll go to church. And then the boyfriend came and pulled her away. And the little girls, what Chris did, though, when the boyfriend wasn't there, she mouthed, call the police. And Shelby slipped away and called the police. I think went to a neighbor's. I think it was before the days of cell phones. And she went back to get the girls and Chris. And she heard yelling and she heard a terrible scream. One of the little girls came to the door and she said, Mike killed my mother. And Shelby said, well, we don't know that. He maybe hurt your mother. We don't know if she's dead. No, she said, he killed my mother. She had some grass from an Easter basket and she pulled it around her neck and said, he did like this. And the police came and Mike had killed Chris Soroya. I did not know it that day. I was just going out soul and I was just following up some visits from the church that I was standing between the living and the dead. I kept a lot of what we used to call visitor cards, guest cards. And I had uh, some people I worked pretty much weekly, some every little bit, some just for special occasions. I kept this card since 1987, May 31st, 1987. 32 years. It says Thomas Head, 6241 Holland, Saginaw, Michigan. I'm a guest of Mr. Shepherd. It was a couple of weeks later. It was hot. Some men had come up from Georgia to put in a swimming pool for us. I went to visit Thomas Head. I, I could have gone home. I'd made enough visits. It was late enough, but I thought, I'll, I'll just try to make this one more visit. And he was at home. His parents were gone. He's probably 21 years old. And had a couple of girls in the house, so then they were maybe 18 or 19. And I started to talk to him and give him the gospel, and the girls were rolling their eyes and making faces. And something inside me said, you ought to leave and come back later when the girls aren't here. Can I say... Those voices are never the Spirit of God. I just went ahead and gave them the gospel. And God quieted them down. And they began to pay attention. And Thomas Head bowed his head and asked Jesus to be his Savior. I went home too late to get in the swimming pool that night. And it was 10 days later. I picked up the Saginaw News. I said that a 21-year-old man was killed at the corner of Portsmouth Road and M46 when somebody ran a stop sign and his name was Thomas Head. I did not know it that night, but I was standing between the living and the dead. Hey, hold the sensor up. Keep tracts in your pocket. 
Be willing to be a witness at work even if they give you a hard time. Keep making time in your schedule to go out knocking on doors and telling people the gospel of Jesus Christ. Keep running the buses. Keep after sinners. Keep a church that the poorest and, and most downtrodden and least acceptable in society find love and welcome and acceptance and the high and mighty find love and acceptance as well. Keep a gospel invitation. Keep an opportunity for people to know Jesus. Keep out yourself telling people the gospel of Jesus Christ. You're standing between the living and the dead. Our Father in heaven, best I know I've done what you told me to do. Speak to our hearts. I bet you a bunch of us have kind of backed off. Lost the zeal we once had. Do our duty. We're faithful. This is a good crowd. These are good people. We've forgotten the plague is spreading. People are dying. Thousands of them in our country, in our world every day. And somebody needs to hold high the censor of salvation and tell them that there is hope and help. Somebody needs to stand between the living and the dead. Our heads are bowed and our eyes closed. Has the Spirit of God spoken in your heart? Could I invite you to <coughs> come to an old-fashioned altar and find a place to talk to him about it? Lord, help us all to be obedient to your Spirit. We well, thank you in Jesus' name for what you do. Amen.